Good afternoon, guys. This is Shay again coming to you with another video, uh, this time talking about the chemical basis of life. Um, this is being recorded on uh, January the 11th, uh, 2023. We covered the first 10 lecture slides within class today, and I apologize for not having a lecture preview up for you. But again, this is going to be one of those um, videos that you can come back and just uh, Refamiliarize yourself with some of the terms and some of the concepts that we discussed in class. Um, again, this is going to be something that I plan to do for you before every class, and I highly encourage you guys to watch these videos as I feel like it will be very beneficial. So, again, what is a chemical reaction? Again, we said today this is um, this is going to be a reaction that uh, either releases or absorbs energy. If you guys remember today on the board, I drew A plus B yielding a product being C. We said that A and B were going to be our reactants and that C was going to be our products. We talked about there being different types of reactions. And again, there are types of reactions. There's either exergonic or endergonic. Um, whenever we classify an a reaction is being exergonic. We mean that it is spontaneous, and the fact that it's spontaneous means that it can proceed directly from A to B over to C, meaning that it releases energy, right? It releases more energy than it absorbs. And when we begin to look at that in terms of something called the delta G, being the delta G, meaning the change of energy from the reactants to the products, um, we, are, we, we can say that the delta G is negative, right? Um, whenever we talk about the change of free energy uh, in terms of an endergonic reaction, this means that it absorbs more energy, right, than it releases. So it requires more input of energy than is released. There's a term here that we are going to discuss called metabolism, and again, this was covered in Bio 112, but we'll revisit that here. Uh, metabolism is just the sum of all the chemical reactions in the body. Um, I know we talk about um, cellular respiration and glycolysis and the electron transport chain in terms of the metabolism of the body, but guys, there is so many different metabolic processes that occur um, within our body. They occur within the respiratory system. The blood has a built-in um, metabolic pathway in order to maintain a normal blood pH that we will discuss um, either later on in the semester or in anatomy and physiology too. But again, uh, I just wanted to drive home the point that the body uses both exergonic, which is um, a reaction that releases energy as well as endergonic reactions in order to achieve all of these metabolic processes. So again, if you guys remember in class, I asked you what were the reactants. This was uh, pretty simple for the most part. Uh, this is just the formation of water. And on the left-hand side, we have two hydrogen, or actually this would be four hydrogen uh, molecules as well as two oxygen molecules. These come together to again form two molecules of water. So on the left-hand side was our reactants, and again, we had our products. Uh, again, introducing ourselves to some more terms, we talked about energy, energy being the capacity to do work. Um, energy came in different forms we discussed, whether it was potential or kinetic. Uh, potential energy being energy that is stored. We talked about a stored storage of energy. I talked about kicking the ball. Um, when the ball was, uh, before it left my foot, it had potential energy, right? It wasn't actually moving, but it had the potential to move and create energy. And then once it was actually moving, um, we called that kinetic. And then I discussed chemical energy. And chemical energy coming in the form of compounds or molecules, right? I discussed whether it be the ice cream or the piece of pizza. Uh, before it was actually ate, maybe while the pizza was still in the box, it had potential energy, right? It had the potential to supply us with energy. And once our body took in the piece of pizza or the ice cream, um, the digestive enzymes were able to break down those compounds and molecules and absorb the nutrients, allowing us then to move and have kinetic energy. So this brings me to my next point which is the law of conservation of energy. And again, I'll come down here and say that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's only transferred. So imagine that piece of pizza, right, when the pizza box. 
the piece of pizza, while it's in the pizza box, has potential energy, right? It has the potential to contain energy. Um, and that potential energy, right, is also considered to be what? Chemical energy because it's stored in compounds and particles. As we ingest that uh, pizza, it then is able to be broken down, like we previously just said, into kinetic energy. The only energy that is lost is in the form of heat, right? And we know that we, uh, uh, during the breakdown of these organic compounds and molecules, we will release some of this and we'll transfer it, transfer it in the form of heat. But again, neither uh, in, n neither the energy in the uh, the pizza when it's uh, before it's digested or after it's digested is uh, lost, it's just transferred from one form to another. And that's called the first law of conservation of energy. We discussed another term, and this was called the activation energy. And what is the activation energy? This is just the energy needed to break the bonds of the reactants and begin forming the chemical reaction, right? This is going from point A to point C. Um, and again, point A and point B, then going on to point C. Um, there's a very nice diagram up here demonstrating the activation energy present here. Um, as you can see here, this dashed line um, is going to be the reaction with the enzyme. As you can see here, this solid line is the reaction without the enzyme. So this could be in the form of, um, for example, um, this could be sugar that is present within the cabinet or sugar that is um, uh, sugar that is uh, that is present uh, in the cabinet. Um, as the sugar sets, if we set there long enough, eventually it will break down into its different byproducts, right? Uh, but however, if we add an agent like uh, amylase to that sugar, right? Uh, whenever we add an enzyme, it does it much quicker. It doesn't matter whether we add the enzyme, right? We are still going to get the products. Adding the enzyme just means it's going to get there at a faster rate. It doesn't necessarily change the products that you get. It just determines how fast you will get there. And again, this is called the activation energy, the energy needed from getting from point A, our reactants, to point B, our products. Again, here depicted on the left side of the screen is something that we discussed earlier, an exergonic reaction. Uh, exergonic reactions are spontaneous in the fact that they release energy. Right, So we have reactants starting out here. This is our free energy knowing that we have a positive free energy right here and knowing that down here our free energy is going to be negative. If we take the uh, products minus the reactants in an exergonic reaction, we're going to have a negative delta G. And that is exactly what we would have. This would be the amount of energy that would be released. I guess I should back up and tell you guys about the... Uh, the chemical formula for um, calculating the delta G. Uh, it's the uh, change of free energy of the products minus the change of free energy of the reactants. And as you can see here, free energy is depicted along the uh, x-axis here. So as you can see, there's a negative free energy present within the products, whereas there is a positive free energy within the reactants. If you have a negative minus a positive, you're going to have a negative free energy. And again, that's exactly what this diagram is showing you. Again, this is just going back to the whole concept of potential kinetic energy. Potential energy, this ball has potential. It's not yet moving, but it has the ability to contain energy. And once it starts moving, it then transfers over into kinetic energy. Again, showing you here the chemical energy coming in the form of organic compounds or substances present within the uh, ice cream itself. Once it's ingested by the child, it's able to then become transformed or transferred over into kinetic energy. And we talked about this whole idea of the activation energy, and we begin talking about enzymes and enzymes. Uh, how they lower the activation energy or the energy needed to break the bonds of the reactants to form the products. And I just kind of want to um, show you how enzymes do this. This should be a review for most of you. Uh, we talked about the induced fit model, how the, um, 
the enzyme in the substrate would form a temporary complex and undergo conformational change in order for um, the enzyme and the substrate to come together, right? So uh, an enzyme has an active site. This is the site where the enzyme is actually going to bind, right, where it's going to fit together um, in such that the substrates are actually uh, oriented in a way to act uh, or able to bind. And um, we know that the substrate will undergo conformational change, uh, just meaning that it will conform to uh, the enzyme. I want you to think about a stress ball. Your hand being the enzyme and the substrate being the uh, stress ball. As you put your hand on the stress ball, um, you know that stress ball is going to conform to the shape of your hand. That's exactly how an enzyme and a substrate begin to work together. Um, they, uh, this is called the induced fit model. And we discussed this in uh, Bio 112. Uh, but again, this is just kind of building on that same principle that the enzyme and the substrate complex come together. Once the enzyme and the substrate complex come together, you then will form the product. Um, again, I just want to reiterate that the enzyme does not change whether or not you get the product. You're always going to get the product no matter what. It just changes the time that it takes to get the product, right? And it does that by lowering the activation energy. Uh, I just want to state that again. The enzyme has no effect on the final product. You're going to get the final product no matter what. It just changes the time that it takes to reach that final product, and it does so by lowering the activation energy. I think it's also important to note that, again, that the um, enzyme, once it binds to the substrate and you have the production of the final product, again, it is not used up right? It's not used up. It is reused. And the enzyme itself is not altered in any shape, form, or fashion. It comes out squeaky clean and is able to function again. This is a picture here showing you um, just the difference in the activation energy um, whenever you have an uncatalyzed reaction. And again, an uncatalyzed reaction just means a reaction without an enzyme. Right. This is the blue line. As you can see here, the activation energy is much higher. So from getting from point A to point B, it's going to take longer. Whereas if we add an enzyme here, right, let's say that this is starch. Let's say this is starch. And let's say that uh, in order to break down into glucose right here, we have a solution without an enzyme, amylase. That's the blue line. And then we have starch here whenever you add the enzyme you're going to reach the breakdown into glucose much quicker. Uh, again, there's no difference in the free energy between the catalyzed and uncatalyzed. It's just the time it takes uh, and the fact that it changes the activation energy. This is a picture here showing you the, um, again, pretty much the same thing about how the progress of the reaction uh, is in relationship to the change in free energy. Uh, this next slide is going to be um, a slide that uh, should be familiar to some of you. Some of you guys, it'll be reviewed. Some of you, this may be um, a first time encountering these terms. Uh, but we have four different types of reaction. I would argue that there's three important ones that we would need to know synthesis, decomposition, and exchange. So a synthesis reaction just means, just means that we are building a molecule. This is another term for this is anabolism or ana anabolic, right? It's an anabolic reaction. Um, you can think of steroids being anabolic, right? They're synthesizing uh, proteins in order to form a bigger muscle. So again, over here on the right-hand side of the screen, I'll just give you guys a simplistic um, reaction that's occurring. A plus B equals AB, right? Decomposition, this is a catabolic reaction. This means that we have a large molecule, and guess what we're doing? We're splitting it into smaller ones, right? This is catabolic. This would be the, um, this would be protein breakdown. So um, I want you to think about um, breaking down fat. We've got a fat molecule, and we're going to break it down into its simple components. Here, I've got water, and water is going to be uh, H2O, and it's going to get split into two hydrogen and two oxygen molecules, right? 
Um, this is a catabolic. Anabolic means synthesis. We're building something bigger. Catabolic or decomposition means that we are breaking something down into something smaller. Exchange reactions. Um, exchange reactions are literally going to be exactly what the name implies. Uh, parts of two different molecules are going to trade positions. So I'm sure you've seen examples of exchange reactions in this um, simplistic um, reaction. I have A and B plus C and D. So here, as you can see, that B and C are going to come together and A and D are going to come together. Um, just a little um, illustration. Then there's reversible reactions. These can proceed in both directions depending on the environment. Um, more definitions to become familiar with. We have discussed these in Bio 112. Again, we're going to revisit these because I think it's important to know what organic uh, living things are because, I'll be honest with you, that the entirety of this uh, course is going to deal with things that are going to be made up of organic compounds. So organic compounds are going to contain carbon and hydrogen. That's important to know. Organic compounds contain carbon and hydrogen for the most part. Other molecules are inorganic and are usually electrolytes. So we have uh, molecules that contain carbon and hydrogen. Those are going to be organic in nature. Then you have molecules that are inorganic we're going to term those electrolytes because they're going to contain molecules aside from carbon and hydrogen. Uh, so inorganic, I state here, they do not include both carbon and hydrogen. Uh, examples of the organic compounds that we're going to discuss are going to be things like sugars. Another term for that is carbohydrates. Uh, there's also lipids that we'll discuss, proteins, and nucleic acids. So inorganic substances uh, the, do not have carbon-hydrogen bonds. Again, we just said that. Uh, they're not normally found in living things. Again, these are going to be the trace elements that we previously dis discussed. Um, again, these are going to be minerals, metals, and salts. They're still important for our body. They're still very important for our body, but um, they are uh, not going to be the uh, majority, uh, the major makeup of our body. So water is the most abundant compound in the body. Many chemical reactions take place in water. Water transports chemicals and helps release excess body heat. This is an example of an inorganic substance that's going to be present. Again, why? Because it contains oxygen. What do we say about organic molecules that contain mostly carbon and hydrogen? Oxygen is rele releases energy from metabolic activities from glucose and other molecules. What's this process called? Cellular respiration, right? This is cellular respiration. This is the whole process where your body takes in um, nutrients or uh, uh, food and it breaks it down into ATP. And ATP is going to be, be used for uh, the production of oxygen. Carbon dioxide, this is going to be produced through metabolic processes that occur within the body. Remember, we have CO2 production whenever we talked about the um, citric acid cycle. We also had, we'll also discuss um, CO2 production whenever we talk about um, uh, respiration in anatomy and physiology too. But I want you to just realize that these are examples of inorganic substances in that they contain molecules different than carbon and hydrogen. Remember I said that inorganic compounds, we're also going to call those electrolytes. And electrolytes, um, we call those electrolytes because once you have a compound and you put it in something like a solvent, it's going to dissociate. And it's going to dissociate into its respective electrolytes. For example, sodium chloride. If you dissolve it in a uh, mixture, like let's say water, it's going to dissociate into its respective Na plus and Cl, it's anion and cation. We know that it does that because it's a, an example of an ionic bond. So this cation and anion are examples of electrolytes. Sodium and chloride, those are going to be two um, important electrolytes that you will cover if you um, take any um, further classes in the biological sciences. Um, we'll talk about conditions such as hyponatremia or too little salt or hypernatremia, too much salt. So again, uh, 
not to belabor a point, but electrolytes are inorganic compounds. Uh, we're going to discuss acids and bases, and again, this is going to be a review for most of you guys. We know that acids and bases are measured by what scale? The pH scale. We know that goes between 1 to 14. We know that 7 is considered to be what? 7 is neutral. We know that anything below 7 is considered to be acidic, right? And anything above 7 is considered to be basic, right? So 8 to 14 is basic, 7 and below is acidic, or six, um, I apologize, 6, 6, right? 7 is neutral. So the technical definition of an acid is an electrolyte that releases hydrogen. So I want you to think of the H's, the hydrogens, as being acidic. So this, this um, hydroxyl group here is going to be acidic, right? Because it's going to donate to a base. So an OH negative, an OH negative, this is going to be a base. So I want you to think of H as being an acid. I want you to think of the hydroxyl group, the OH, as being basic. So what happens whenever these acids and bases react? Well, they're going to form something called water, and they're in turn are going to form a salt. So again, whenever acids and bases combine and undergo a reaction, they're going to form water, and they're going to also form a salt as a byproduct. This is... Um, what we previously just said, I uh, just put it in word form. pH is a solution determining whether it's alkaline or acidic. Remember, below 7 equals an acid. Above 7 equals a base. This is an important point. In the body, pH homeostasis, remember homeostasis is maintaining that normal internal environment. We want to ensure that there are an equal number of acids as well as bases. So we have this built-in bicarbonate buffer system. Again, it's called the bicarbonate buffer system in order to maintain a normal amount of acids and a normal amount of bases. This is a uh, this is kind of just a picture here, just letting you know where things lie on the pH scale. Uh, obviously, battery acids horrible. It's almost negative if it's not. Um, I thought this is very interesting for you guys just to know. Whenever you're taking in food and your stomach acid is breaking down. Um, uh, material, whether it be um, uh, a steak or whatever, the gastric acid present within your, your stomach lining, it has a pH of 2. That's very acidic. Your stomach is very acidic. Um, again, here's orange juice. This is why orange juice could probably give you heartburn because look how acidic it is. It's like right around 4. This is why uh, people who uh, drink a lot of carbonated beverages, again, the acidity from these carbonated beverages um, are going to uh, get onto the teeth, and it's actually going to um, strip some of the calcium off of your teeth, right? can affect the enamel on your teeth. Um, here's coffee. Coffee is uh, an acidic drink. Um, once we get down to here, you can start talking about uh, baking soda being sodium bicarbonate. Baking soda is going to be an alkaline solution, uh, household ammonia, things like that. Uh, milk of magnesia, this is why this could be actually very beneficial for somebody who has heartburn. Because again, they have heartburn, the stomach acid is coming up through the esophageal lining. So milk of magnesia has a basic pH. Uh, organic compounds, again, this is just going to introduce you to them. They're mo mo mostly made from carbon and hydrogen. So um, these are the basic ones that we're going to talk about that are going to be most important. Carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, as well as something called ATP. And if you remember today, I said that was the energy currency of the cell, adenosine triphosphate. And um, so these organic compounds are made up of carbon and hydrogen, like I previously discussed. And there's something that you're going to learn in organic chemistry if you ever take that that is going to talk about and it's going to discuss something called a carbon skeleton. And a carbon skeleton is just going to be uh, essentially all these carbon molecules attached to each other. And aside from those, carbons are going to be called things called functional groups. And functional group is going to be what's attached to the carbons. And I'll show you that here. So here is going to be an example of a uh, carboxyl group. We have a carbon here. 
bound to two oxygen molecules, right? We have two bonds onto an oxygen, and it's bound to an OH group. So we call this a carboxyl group. This is an amino group. So if this was a carbon bound to uh, NH2+, plus, this would be called an amino group. And uh, what do you, where do you think the term amino acid comes from? We have a carboxylic group attached to an amino group, and then we have a third bond coming off of that carbon group, and that will determine which amino acid that it actually is. Here's a hydroxyl group that we previously discussed, talking about it being OH negative. Um, here's a carbonyl group. Uh, I'm not going to kill you guys on these functional groups. It's not that important for our purposes, but again, this is just an introduction to if you're going to take deeper classes like organic chemistry or things like that, if you're wanting to go further, these functional groups will be important for your all's purposes. Carbohydrates. Um, Actually, this is a very good stopping point. We've covered the first 20 slides, and I will have a preview for lecture two coming up for you guys before the next class. Uh, I greatly appreciate your guys' attention, and I think these videos are going to be very beneficial for you guys, especially before coming to class, just kind of, just trying to get a basic understanding of the material being presented before it's actually presented. This will give you the opportunity to um, ask questions and things like that. So thank you for your patience and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.